card is emerging underneath you. So you still can't um, avoid them. And there are a number of reasons um, for this charisma. I mean, you don't have to um, uh, even mention the, the, the cool names that a lot of cicadas have, the, the, the common names, things like sand fairies, candy tiger squawkers, chocolate soldiers, sand grinders. These, these are really, really uh, cool names that kind of stick with you when you hear them. But it's not just the, uh, the common names that are, that are really awesome. Um, there's also the scientific names. So genera like you're a delicious or you're a banana. They're also um, you know, things that you don't forget that easily. And a lot of it stems back to our, our childhoods. Um, a lot of people I talk to um, say, you know, reminisce of their child, uh, some childhood stories, times about finding cicadas in the playground and showing them um, to your friends or finding out who's really you know, terrified of cicadas and their, and their nymph casings and uh, sneaking up with an empty nymph casing and uh, sticking it on their shirt and watching them scream and in terror and run away. Not that I ever did that. Um, but these are all, you know, really sort of positive memories for a lot of us. And the other key thing is that, you know, the cicadas, they, they peak for us around uh, in, in summer around the school holidays. And in particular, the, the holiday period, um, Christmas and, and New Year's. And these are quite, you know, traditionally positive things um, for us in the year because we can forget about about work and just enjoy time with families and you know at the beach or at, at the park and hearing cicadas it's just it's it's the soundtrack of summer and, and something that we just you know we just love and it stems into a lot of um different industries and 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 um into the arts and you know there's a lot of cicada jewelry and 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 books out there so i've got a, a photo uh, an image here of the front cover of a book called cicada by sean tan which is a i guess a young adult um picture book um cicadas are also important um in in china where they're they're seen as, uh, I guess, a symbol of, of rebirth uh, or, or a second chance. You know, you've got this, this previous life of, or, or this life of um, solitary, uh, of, of dirty, dark, sort of underground nymph living its life. And then this, this nymph crawls out on the tree and emerges as a beautiful cicada with, with wings. It's a, it's a rebirthing. It's a chance at a, at, at a new life and being able to fly somewhere different. Um, also recently, a couple of years ago, um, Kate Moore, who's a uh, local um, composer, she uh, wrote a piece called Cicada Day um, for a string quartet, which was um, inspired by her um, memories of cicadas in Australia. So, you know, we really connect with it on, on, on different levels and it, it's just, it's such a, such a wonderful thing. So uh, the first part of this um, talk, I guess, is going to be a bit of a, a, a cicada lesson, possibly a, a 101 lesson for some of you who, who are interested and know quite a bit about cicadas. But um, I'm going to run through a, a lot of the things we, we know before then diving into some of the, some of the unknowns. So obviously, the, the cicada has um, a number of different, different structures, like um, a lot of uh, other or, or all other insects. So we've got um, a pair of fore wings and, and hind wings for the adult cicada. We have the thorax, the head, the abdomen, the operculum is the, uh, what you might think is the, uh, I guess, um, spherical discs that um, encase the timbal. So they're the, the sound amplifying instrument, um, if you will. And cicadas also have this, this rostrum, this um, proboscis that they use to to feed um, from from plants. I don't know why there's some squiggles on my on my screen, but I don't know how to get rid of them. But anyway, we'll press on. Um, so cicadas, they're, they're harmless. They're sap sucking insects. Just they're in the same family as aphids and leaf hoppers. But there's one um, key difference. Um, to cicadas and how you can help uh, identify those in the field. And those are these three false eyes, which we call ocelli. They're 
in between the two compound eyes. They kind of look like three little jewels to a lot of us because when you, can, when you see them in the right light or when you take a photo of them with a flash, they, kind of, they reflect the light and they look like these little, little tiny jewels. Now these are simple eyes that are, are used to um, detect movement for this carter. This, you know, I can't, I don't know who's put that, um, all that drawings on there, but anyway. Um, so, cicadas are mostly, they're tropical insects, they, they love the heat. Um, obviously, they... they Excuse me, Nathan, excuse me, Adrian here. Uh, there's one, one of our participants is uh, playing a little game. I'm not sure who it is. Sorry, Kim. Um, I've had this happen on one of my other Zoom meetings somewhere else. And uh, so could they kindly stop drawing on our screen so we can enjoy the presentation? I'm not sure who it is. Uh, thanks. I'll unmute. Thank you. Bye. No worries. It's all, the, all part of the, the fun of, of um, the online universe. Um, but so, yeah, they, the cicadas, they, they herald summer. And, and our season here in Sydney, it runs from approximately September um, through to March. Now, there are some um, species that will drag on into, into uh, April, May, and, and even June for one or two species. Just depends on how good a season um, uh, each year is. Now, one of the key things I want to stress is that cicadas are harmless. They, they, can only, they only suck sap and excrete water. A lot of us hear these things about cicadas trying to use their, their rostrum to pierce our skin and, and suck our blood. They, they can't actually pierce our skin. It's not, it's not strong enough to be able to do that. It can only pierce the soft wood in trees. And they, they excrete water. That's, that's their, their urine. And, and when... You know, you, we refer to this when, when it happens on mass as cicada rain. You know, you can be walking along um, a bush track and hear all the cicadas, then suddenly you think it's, it's starting to rain and it's, it's actually all the cicadas um, peeing on you from, from above. But it, it's really just, just water. But I'm not, I'm not suggesting you, you um, look up and, and open your mouth, but yeah. So each species of cicada has a, a, a different song and that song is sung by the male with the sole purpose to attract females. And male, we tend to find that males sing around about once the temperature reaches 18 degrees um, or above. Now there's a little bit of a behavioral difference too between the species, the larger species such as uh, the black princes, your, your green grocers, the females actually fly to uh, the, the singing males. Now this is different when you get to the smaller species because the males tick and, and call as, the, when, as they're flying or when they're at resting, when they're resting on the trees. And if a female is, is interested in a male, she actually flicks her wings uh, once after each male call. It sounds just like a, the clicking of, a, of your fingers. And that lets the, the male know that there's a female and she's interested in him. And then he needs to basically triangulate where she is because she's just not going to move for him. She's going to wait for him to come to, to her. So the song of the cicada can reach 120 decibels. And now that's actually, once it reaches 85 decibels or higher, that's, that's painful to the human ear and can cause uh, ear damage um, with prolonged exposure to, to noises at that level. And so that's made by a pulse mode of, of, of what we call timbal bending. So here on the left, this is uh, an image of a timbal. And what it is, is this, is this ribbed sort of structure, which um, the cicada sort of pulses air through it. And it can do that up to 300, 400 times a second. And that's how it creates its unique song. Some species will also rub their wings for sound as part of their um, unique um, calling song. Now there's about three and a half species, three and a half thousand species worldwide that we know of. Australia is by far the cicada capital of the world. We have at least 800 species that we know of. We reckon we could probably hit and surpass the 1000 mark if we could actually get out to sort of the more, you know, isolated, remote, arid central regions of, of Australia. Um, 
But of that 800 that we know of, there's only there's around about half of those that are actually scientifically described. So we're actually we're finding more species than what we can actually keep up with with the description. Now, just to put that into perspective, in North America, they have around about 180 species of cicada, uh, most notably the Magi cicada, which um, there's a lot of uh, news about because they emerge en masse. In New Zealand, um, just across the, the ditch, they have around about 45 species of cicadas, which is around about the number of species that we actually have in the greater Sydney region alone. And the poor UK only has the, <laughs> the one species of cicada. One nation is lucky to have it too. <laughs> so many cicadas um, have pet names too. So we also we know <laughs> common names like the green grocer, black prince, red-eyed fairy, cherry nose, raised griner, double drummer, sand fairy, the list is, is endless. So I mentioned that cicadas can get up to 120 decibels in, in sound. A typical green grocer is calls around about the 105 decibel uh, range. And typically when you have multiple individuals um, calling at the same time, so what we call cicada chorusing, it per individual it increases the sound by about one decibel. So if, one, if two are calling at 105 decibels, the overall sound reading is about 106, and that increases the more, um, more individuals you have. So just to put that into perspective, you know, you're looking around about a, a ba the, sound, the noise a baby makes when it's crying, uh, a little bit softer than a jet plane fly flying above or an ambulance siren passing you by. And uh, for those of us that have spent their, uh, their years in, in, in rock concerts too, it's, you know, it's getting up towards um, that, that sort of a level. So, you know, very loud and, and yeah, with prolonged um, exposure, it can be, be damaging to the human ear. So cicadas vary in size um, quite considerably. So here on the, on the left, we have the largest um, species of cicada in Australia, the Eastern Double Drummer. This has a wingspan of around about 15 centimetres. So it, it is huge. You, you really will know if one lands on the back of you. And you compare that with um, something like one of the smallest species um, in the country, this is the brown heath buzzer, which is only about a centimetre in length, you know, so there's a huge uh, size difference um, in our cicada species. And of course, cicadas vary quite, uh, quite significantly, quite dramatically in their, um, in their appearance. So we have a lot of species that are, that are uh, you know, they're absolutely stunning. They're, they're beautiful. You know, you've got these rich leafy greens and, and others that are red, gold and, and blue or gold and black. They're just, they're, they're absolutely stunning. Um, the other thing I'd like to, to mention is that we've, we've all heard of the, um, the green grocer, possibly our, our country's most iconic cicada species, but there's actually a number of uh, colour morphs of this species. Now, some of you might have heard of, of the Yellow Monday or the, or the Mask Devil. Mask Devil's quite uh, common up in the Upper Blue Mountains and down towards the Southern Highlands. There is also a ultra rare blue moon um, cicada. I think we only have seen or know of uh, three specimens, I think, in the last 20 or so years, two of which were found by my um, sister in our backyard um, growing up in, in Burwood. So she has um, that one up on me. But um, yeah, very, very rare. But essentially these are, these are all the same species, but they're just um, different based on, on which color pigment is, um, is either present or, or absent. And there's also the uh, northern greengrocer, which occurs up towards the, the tropics of um, uh, North Queensland. Okay, so I'm gonna um, go over the cicada life cycle now, and I'm gonna kick this off with a video that's a couple of minutes long. So 
um, yeah, enjoy it and I'll come back at the end of it. The life cycle of a cicada begins as a tiny egg, about the size of a pinhead, which is laid by a female. When hatched, the nymph falls to the ground and buries itself beneath the soil where it will live for up to 10 years. When fully grown, the nymph crawls out of the ground during the night and finds the nearest tree. Here, it will begin its incredible transformation. It takes almost the whole night for the adult cicada to emerge from its shell and to fully develop its wings. The adult cicadas leave behind their old shells, which are often found the next morning on fences and trees. As an adult, a cicada only has a short time to find a mate. Male adult cicadas search for females by singing to them. The male cicadas have a pair of drummers that help to create and amplify their song, and each species has its own song to sing. When a female is found, the cicadas will mate and the female will find a new tree to lay her eggs. Okay, pretty cool, pretty um, unique life cycle. Life cycle. Oh, don't want to hear it again. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty unique um, life cycle. So, I mean, just just sort of capturing the the key components of that. So, you know, life begins for a cicada as an egg, and it it takes around about seven to twenty one days before it it hatches. Now, the female has an ovipositor, which she uses to to pierce the the soft wood and lay these eggs so they're out of the direct sunlight and are, and are protected. And after this time, once the, the egg hatches, it, the, the, the tiny nymph, it's, it's, it's so, so tiny, the size of a pinhead, it will free fall to the ground and will start burying um, itself underground to, to then start feeding um, off the tree. And, you know, this, this stage of the, the life cycle is pretty much the, you know, nine, makes up 90, 95% of the, the, the life cycle. The, the nymph will live underground for between 1 to 17 years, depending on the, on the species. And when it, while underground, it will undergo a number of, of molts as it gets larger and, and increases in, in, in size. And when it's fully mature um, and temperatures start to warm up, it will... Um, emerge from the soil and will molt um, and shed or undergo its final molt where it becomes the, the adult cicada um, on the tree. And, you know, in relative to the, the, that long period of time underground, it's, it's only one to six weeks that an adult will survive um, above ground. And it really only has one purpose and that's just to, to find itself a mate and I think we could all, all agree if, you know, you spend that time dark, dirty on your own for up to 17 years, you know, you would kind of want to, you know, get out above ground and, and you know, make yourself heard and, and you know, try to find yourself um, someone to, you know, pair up with. Okay, so here's a, here's a fun little fact too. Did you know that you could actually identify the uh, sex of the cicada based on its nymph shell. So when you find um, a shell on the tree, you can, you can pick it off and have a look. If you turn it over um, on the underside of it, you can actually identify the male um, from the female because the male lacks this ovipositor kind of imprint um, on, the, on the underside of the cicada shell. A bit easier to see 
um, for the larger larger species. But if you happen to have a hand lens or a magnifying glass um, on you in the field, you can you can identify whether um, it's a male or a female. And this can give us a good idea of of when um, each sex might be emerging in one um, particular area. Because usually we find that the males will emerge before the females. So when the females emerge, there are actually males um, there to, to mate up with. Okay, I touched on this um, a little bit earlier, but each cicada species has its own uh, unique call song. And they can be quite loud and, and monotonous like the, the double drummer here. So this constant high pitch whine that sounds like you're underneath uh, electrical wires um, just keeps going on and on and, um, forever. And then this uh, golden twanger um, down here has a has a more intricate um, call. I hope you can all hear that. A series of, of, of short buzzes and, and sort of rapid fire clicks that, that punctuate each call. So they can be very complex and, and um, or, or very, very simple. And of course, you know, when, when you get out into the woods and you, you take a moment to listen, you can get this kind of cacophony of, of cicada calls and it, it can become quite difficult to, uh, I guess, just determine how many different species or how even, you know, how many individuals you might be hearing um, out in the, um, in the bush. And this is a really important point because this, this is one of the key ways that we can identify um, cicadas both in the wild and also when it comes to scientifically describing them because each of them are unique. So we can identify species and never even see it but know it's, know it's there and present in the environment. And the way we, we describe that um, when we come to describing a species is we basically break down the song um, as... as as, um, as far as we can. So we describe the number of the syllables, the macro syllables, um, the buzzes, the, the how long it takes between each, each phrase, each calling song before it repeats itself and the lengths of silence that punctuate these, these syllables and, and, and buzzes. And they can be quite simple like this, uh, you know, this Lansburyi, which is just a, a, a doublet pulse that's repeated again and again. And its dominant frequency is, is quite high. It's up at 21 kilohertz, which is almost inaudible to, to most, um, most human ears. Or they can be quite complex, like this, this fire tower calling song, which has uh, two different components. It has a, an initial um, buzzing component, and then when it's sort of really warmed up and really revving, then it, then it moves into this repetitive um, buzzing component. So we break both of those down and identify um, the frequency in which um, is dominant for that um, cicada call. So the rule of thumb is where the larger the, the cicada, that usually we find the dominant frequency is, is much lower, moving towards zero. That's when you get your very sort of low and, and loud calls that, that just about anyone can hear. So that kind of covers a lot about uh, the basic um, biology of, of cicadas. Um, but there's really a lot of things that we, we just, we, we don't know and we should know. Um, I've mentioned it at the start, we, we just don't know how many cicada species there are. We could have a couple of hundred at least more here in Australia alone. It's very variable how, uh, how long a cicada stays on the ground. It's very species specific, but we don't know. We, we haven't actually been able to uh, collect nymphs when they when they emerge and sort of keep them and, and monitor them over a number of years and kind of like I guess uh, sort of like an ant farm sort of set up so you can watch and see um, what they do and, and how long they spend underground. Another um, key thing that, that would be really fantastic to know is what triggers a cicada to emerge um, at night and emerge as an adult. We know that the warmer temperatures, so when the when we get into spring, the the, mi the minimum temperature sort of gets into those, starts reaching and surpassing those double digits. That tends to encourage um, cicadas to emerge. Um, just uh, similarly, a, a a rainfall event too, a bit of moisture 
um, in the soil is, is, a, is a trigger for a cicada, but we don't know how much and when. We do know that cicadas will test um, their environment, so they'll sort of dig, a, dig up and, and emerge and kind of go, mm, yeah, it looks pretty good. I might, uh, I might merge later tonight. It's looking pretty good. Or if they, they feel that oh, it's, it's looking a bit dicey, I don't know, they, might, they will actually go back underground and, um, and wait for, for another, a longer period of time. Because they're, they're periodic, they, they emerge almost en masse, um, it, we, we, we're not very sure on what their distribution patterns are. Um, it's very hard for the few, uh, I, I guess, hobby researchers um, in the country to be able to, to be everywhere at once, particularly uh, when we all have, have day jobs. Um, during the week, so you know we we still are, are a bit sort of uncertain on the on the distribution patterns. Um, harking to my um, plant um, uh, science background, I I'm curious to know whether there are there are associations between um, different plants and and cicada species. Whether there are some um, cicadas that have a very very close bond, a very sort of specialist. Um, association with certain plant species or whether they are quite quite generalist um, overall. And building on from that, whether different vegetation communities also um, host um, unique cicada communities. And that's just that's just touched the tip of the iceberg for what we still need to know about cicadas. So a lot of people ask me this question, why why cicadas? You know, what's what's the point? Of cicadas aside from making me deaf. Well, you know, as, as I mentioned before, Australia is the cicada capital of the world, so why don't we know more? Why aren't we leading uh, the, the, the understanding, the knowledge um, of these cicadas and their um, ecological preferences? You know, they're part of our soundtrack to summer, along with, with frogs, lawnmowers, barbecues, beaches. It's, 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 it's things that we cherish. And you will know them whether or not you love them or hate them, as I've said, because they just emerge en masse and just, whoa, okay, they're here. Um, critically too, they provide a, a, a pulse, a, a food source pulse in the hotter, drier months over, over summer. So they're key um, food for a lot of animals, particularly birds, but also some, some other species like, like possums and, and other animals will also consume these cicadas, fruit bats um, too. And the other question we sort of started asking ourselves more recently is, is are these cicadas indicators of long-term landscape changes or, or perhaps even, even climate change? You know, if you've got a, a cicada that's spending 10 years underground, a lot can happen above ground. Um, you know, a, a perfectly um, pristine woodland um, one year, 10 years later, has a, has a six-lane highway over it. And the cicada's just got no chance of, of emerging and reproducing. And just to put that last point in, in context, uh, I just want to talk quickly about the sand fairy as a case study. Now, this species is, is quite uh, unique and quite, quite specific. It occurs in spinifex grass on, on sand dunes um, along the, the east coast in, in the beaches of New South Wales. It, it, it has a historical distribution we know of from, from around about Ballina um, to Bermagui um, in the far New South Wales south coast. And we quite commonly picked up this species um, up, up to about 1995 and then, then there, was, there was nothing. It just it sort of disappeared and we just weren't picking it up in areas where it was quite common um, from and so there's a there's a um, an illustration of the of the distribution there on the right. And then all of a sudden in, in 2014, um, it got picked up again by a, a citizen scientist on the New South Wales South Coast um, and got shared on on one of the the social media platforms. And this you know got us thinking, oh, it's 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 still around here. It's not completely not completely gone. So you know we did some some targeted searches and and things around some of the the beaches around New South Wales. And you know we we're now fairly confident that this species distribution has has retracted south and it, it is now restricted from around about the northern beaches area of Sydney 
um, down to about the south coast. The south coast in particular is, is kind of the, the last stronghold of this um, sand ferry. And we, we postulate that the causes of this, uh, you know, not just um, landscape changes um, and human impacts such as dune trampling or, or beach modification. There, there are also, you know, climate change impacts. Um, there's more frequent king tides and storm cells, and this leads to, to drone erosion and, and, and loss of habitat. So, you know, this is that's that's quite a um, a stark example, but it's it's a it's a very important example because we want to move away from being reactive to predictive. We want to not document things after they've happened and changes after they've happened to species. And this this doesn't go for cicadas. This this is this is in regards to everything. We want to be able to predict what um, or which species might be at risk and which ones might be. Um, you know, a bit more uh, sort of sheltered from from changes into the future, and you know, the way we can do this is we need we need data. This is what the whole scientific discipline is is predicated on is is having data. Once we have data, there's so much that we can do um, and use it for. So how do we get data, and and particularly for you know not just not just cicadas, but also for for plants and animals, you know a whole a whole range of species. We need to you know we need to encourage more more people to be naturalists, and you know you know why as Carl Linnaeus said, the first step in wisdom is to know the things themselves. If we don't know anything about them, we we can't do anything for them. We can't we can't protect them. We we don't understand what their their preferences, what their requirements are, what they need to be able to survive and reproduce produce successfully. Now, we, we live in an age of technology and, and I mean, it, it's, it's fantastic. It allows us to have these, these meetings now in this, in this new world that we, we find ourselves in. And, you know, our, our lives pretty much revolve around um, a device or, or devices for some of us. You know, we, we find we, we, we're connected with, with one another more than what we ever were in, in the past. And to, in, in a lot of um, aspects, it can seem like a, a, a negative. But, you know, I, I would argue that there's a lot of positives to it outside of even being able to connect and provide, um, you know, have these talks and share all this knowledge with you, with you all. It's, it's a fantastic time to be a naturalist because of technology. We can connect and share information just at the touch of a button, click of our fingers, it's there. We can share information, we can get information, we can ask questions, we can get answers in a, in a blink of an eye. And that's just thanks to all these social media platforms and other sharing platforms that, that are out there, um, not to mention email as well. And it's not just the uh, the software too; it's the hardware as well. So, I I, I mentioned that we um, we use the species uh, unique call song to be able to identify it and, and describe the species scientifically. So this is obviously requires us to have a recording of the species call in the first place. And traditionally, we'd have this sort of you know fancy, expensive setup with um, directional microphones and and audio recorders, headphones, and go out to the field and and you'd be looking really cool with all this stuff and 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 that's what would enable you enable you to to get the call um, song to be able to analyze that in the computer. But you know these days you don't need any of that expensive gadgetry. You've got you know the perfect device in your pocket, the, the smartphone. It's got everything you need. It's got an audio recorder, voice recorder, GPS, camera to record photos or videos. It's connected to the internet most times in Australia. So, you know, you've really got all this information that you can collect with it and then upload that and send it um, with just a touch of a button. And so I, I use this um, I get a kind of example to show um, or to stress why we need to have um, more people out there looking for for cicadas or looking for other species. You know, if if our if this uh, Where's Wally map is sort of representative of um, you know the Greater Sydney region, and we're trying to find you know Wally or say we're trying to find a, a specific species of cicada. If I was just to go out there, it's going to take me a long time to try and find what I'm looking for. I've got to go through this whole area and search for what I need. 
But if I have my best friend with me, is also keen on cicadas, then we can say, okay, I'll take the eastern side and you take the western side, and we can effectively split our search area in half. So theoretically, it should take us half the amount of time to find our target. But if we have more and more people, we can then break up the region into different areas, and we've only got a very small fraction of that region to search. And then finally, you know, it doesn't take very long until one of us says, okay, I found our target. There's Wally or there's our cicada or there's, there's the, the plant species that we're after. Now that's all well and good if we're only after one individual, but what happens if we're trying to understand the distribution of a species or how many individuals of that species are actually out there, like here, how many Wallies are there on the map? It becomes even more tricky. So the more people we have out there looking for things and documenting things, then the more information we're gonna get over a shorter period of time, and we're gonna be able to answer some of those questions and move from being reactive into a predictive frame of mind. So that's where citizen science um, comes in and, and citizen scientists. So citizen science is the collection and, and analysis of information or, or, or data relating to the environment by members of the general public. And this is done typically as a joint project with, with scientists, not always, but, but most times. And those who help collect this data, we refer to as citizen scientists. Now, just to get you, um, uh, I'll show you an example of how citizen scientists can um, lead to great discoveries. We had uh, a couple of years ago a um, citizen scientist who found um, a, an individual of this red-eyed fairy cicada, which we'd only actually known of um, by five other previous specimens in the Sydney region. We found previously found in the Royal National Park and in the Upper Boo Mountains in Lockley's Pylon um, outside of of Lura. So we had, and we had no idea that it occurred anywhere else. And then lo and behold, in 2018, um, a keen naturalist found it um, south of Nara on the New South Wales south coast. And well, geez, this like blows its distribution by, or extends it by, by, you know, 200%. It was just, it was fantastic. And, you know, we just, we wouldn't have ever known this if it wasn't for someone who, who found this and, and posted it onto, um, an amateur entomology page on, on Facebook and said, you know, what is this? And, you know, one thing led to another and, and this is just a fantastic discovery. So, you know, you never know what you might find when you go out into the bush. And so a couple of years ago, um, we, uh, myself and a, a, a friend and, and colleague of mine, Alan, we started this um, group called Cicada Rama. And really we just wanted to be able to provide a platform um, and discussion-based uh, forum to share our knowledge of cicadas and, and interest through citizen science. And we really wanted to combine um, this, uh, I guess, nature education and science to inspire the love of nature in everyone. Now, I won't go into this too much because I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking quite a lot and running a bit late on time, but my interest is in, in plant associations with cicadas and there's little that's known globally about um, the plant associations and ecological preferences in general of, of cicadas. Um, we don't know whether they have specific um, associations and why this might be the case, whether there's uh, specific nutrients in the xylem that cicadas, um, some species require. Um, protection from predators or camouflage, some species are large and green like the green grocer or the bladder cicada, they might um, prefer trees that are quite green and provide them with, with protection from birds. And in Sydney, we're in quite a unique um, spot in the world because we have a lot of cicada species that actually can be heard in the suburbs and, and even right in the central business district, um, which is quite unique in the world. So there's been a few observations and speculations about which plant cicadas um, are commonly found on, but there's no um, quantification of this information. And interestingly for us in, in Sydney, we have this opportunity to try and tease apart whether these species that we hear in the, in the um, CBD or in the more urban areas, whether these are occurring here because they have more generalist plant associations or um, uh, relative to those that we don't hear in the, in the urban regions. So, um, 
iNaturalist is a is a fantastic platform. You've probably all heard of this. If if you don't, I, I really encourage you to look it up. Um, it's a fantastic um, platform to be able to to identify and and to record any species you find anywhere in the world at, at any um, point in time. And the fantastic thing about it is that you don't actually have to know what you found to be able to upload it to iNaturalist. If you see a cicada, you can just type in that it was a cicada. You can um, add information on where are you. If you do this through your phone, it will be automatic, but you can also do it um, through the computer. And critically, you can add media to your observation. You can add photos, you can, and, and great for cicadas or frogs or birds, you can even add sound files, sound recordings, to your identification. So if you have something that just says cicada in there, you post it onto iNaturalist with some photos or with some sound if you can hear them but can't see them. And later on, experts will find will, will see these observations and will listen to this to the calls or look at the photos and be able to help identify what it is you've found, either down to the, the species level or even to the, the genus. So using this platform five years ago now, so we'll be entering our sixth uh, season um, in spring, I started this project called the Great Cicada Blitz. And this was set up to encourage people to, to record their sightings, their observations of cicadas around um, New South Wales. And I asked um, the public to also, when they, when they can to uh, include the plants that they, um, observe the cicada to be calling from or, or, or see that see it on um, down to down to as far as they could they could identify it and from this uh, information we can we can sort of download all this data on a on a annual basis and have a look and and, and sort of tease apart um, different trends so we can have a look at and you know what species is most commonly um, heard in one particular year and not so much in another. Um, and, and this gives us an idea of whether some species are sort of undergoing, I guess, a, a boom or, or, or bust, whether they, they disappear for a few years and you, they're not really picked up, and then they suddenly emerge in, a, in another particular, um, in a later year. And this will give us some insights um, in the longer term, how long these species might be spending underground before they then um, uh, emerge as adults. So I mentioned um, we can um, get some plant data as well. I mentioned that we um, that I asked um, observers to include the the, the plants that they observed the cicada on, and so we can take this data and um, quantify this. And so if we look at the the native species in particular, you see this overwhelming um, uh, number of eucalyptus um, species that cicadas are, are commonly heard on. And, and I guess unsurprisingly too, there's, there's, um, there's clistamans, melaleucas, casuarinas. These are typically plants that we um, commonly um, as associate with cicada species in urban areas in particular, because they are lined, uh, our suburban streets are lined, I should say, with these um, plants by council. And there's quite a lot of cicadas that seem to be um, associating with these species. But it's not just the natives as well, there are also some um, exotic species that um, commonly occur. Nowhere near to the same degree as, as native species, but they're still there and I, I thought I, I should include them. So they're things like, like jacarandas, London plane trees, uh, camphor laurels, pine trees, li liquid ambers. These are, these are the most um, common exotic plant species that cicadas are being um, observed on. So the results so far, and we're still, um, I guess, analyzing those, those results because we've got now over 7,000 observations. So it's a lot of data to, to process. And um, with a lot of citizen science um, data sets, it needs to be sort of a lot of, uh, uh, undergo a lot of cleaning, um, if you will, sort of just tidying things up and making sure everything's um, consistent because we don't all um, uh, enter data the same way, which is, which is perfectly fine. So 
what we wanted to ask um, initially in this data set is, is the likelihood of observing cicadas influenced by different things? So the, the location, the plant type, or, or the land use, in this case, sort of an urban or natural setting. And so far we've taken four years of the citizen science data. We cleaned it up, as I mentioned, and we assigned plant species to either a native or exotic um, type. And we assigned records to occurring in either an urban or natural land type. And when you take the data set as a whole, we found that there's a similar chance of finding a cicada regardless of whether you look at native or exotic plants or whether you're in an urban or natural environment. And really what this, this sort of take home message from that is, is that there's so many cicadas around Sydney and there's so many different species that, you know, if you go to some area, you're more than likely to be able to, to hear or see a, a species. But, it is a different story when you look at it on a species by species basis. So we'll run through some of these quickly if it will work. Yep. Uh, so these are the cicada species that you are more likely to find south of Sydney, so in higher latitudes. There's four species there that are coming up as having a distribution that's um, more commonly um, or more abundant, I guess, south of Sydney. And conversely, there are a number of species too that you're more likely to find north of Sydney in lower latitudes, including the greengrocer, sandstone squeaker, southern bark squeaker, and, and zipping ambertail. And those are the four species there. Now, if you're looking at exotic plants too, there's a suite of cicada species that seem to be, uh, 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 you're more likely to find in these exotic plants. So things like the uh, species like the bladder cicada, the greengrocer, red eye cicadas, black prints, a lot of um, cicadas that are larger in size and may possibly be going to these exotics for, for camouflage, hard to know yet. But there are also a number of small species here too, like the beach squeaker, the silver princess, the spotted wattle cicada that are also uh, being commonly observed in exotic plant species. Also, there are a number of species that you're more likely to find in, in native species. And these are some of the more, I, I guess, not necessarily cryptic, but small blackish brown species um, that seem to be um, more commonly found in, on native plants. Now, interestingly, if you want to see an eastern double drummer, the largest species in Australia, or a Cumberland Ambertail, then you best look at native plants only. These are only being found over four or five years on native plants. Um, really sort of, and I guess the, the name Cumberland Ambertail kind of speaks to that too, because it's only really found in the Cumberland Plain woodlands west of Sydney. And of course, there are um, sets of species too that you're more likely to find if you're in an urban area and if you're in a, in a natural area. So there are quite, um, I guess, unique differences um, in species compositions of cicadas um, dependent on where you are. So there are quite a number of species that seem to persist still in the urban area, whereas there are others that seem to be more confined to the, to the bushland pockets, um, to the Blue Mountains or, or further away from the, the urban, urban um, Sydney area. Um, as I sort of touched on before too, we can also track what species are more or less frequently reported in a, in a season. So, you know, green if um, for a year, if it's if we're seeing a lot more species that particular or individuals of that species in a particular year relative to the, the grey squares. Um, and similarly, if they're um, red, then we seem to be observing um, fewer in, um, in that season. So that gives us an idea on, on potential distribution patterns. So, you know, just to, just to put all that into, into perspective, whether a cicada um, more frequently occurs in an urban or natural area really depends on the species. And that's the same for, for native or exotic um, plants. There are suites of species that are, that are confined to the natural areas, and there are some that are in the natural areas and also in the urban areas as well. So potentially more generalist um, associations there. Um, now quite, Possibly not surprising, cicadas often are occurring on eucalyptus um, species in particular, but also calistamine and melaleuca plants. 
Now, there are also a number of species that are found on these large leafy exotic plants. In that list, you'll, um, you'll note that four or five, uh, three or four of those five are quite large leafy plants like the camphor laurel and the London plane tree. So it makes sense that some of these more colorful, larger species are using these trees um, for um, camouflage and protection from predators. So it's important when you think about the cicada species and what its preferences are to think about its behavior, its size and its color. But what we really want to nail down to it, and we're going to need a lot more data and, and a lot longer term for this, is whether any cicada species have close associations with a plant species. And once we think we might have a, a unique uh, a specialist interaction or association, we might want to sort of like um, nut down to the details and try to understand why that would be the case. So I, uh, I hope that you're all feeling inspired um, now after this talk, the cicada season is after all uh, only two or three weeks away with the start of spring. And I trust you've all downloaded the iNaturalist app um, if you haven't already and um, have logged on to the great cicada blitz ready to join. And, you know, it's, it's really rewarding thing to be a, to be a naturalist and, and to just, you know, discover what's out there because every patch of bush or suburban park or even nature strip is, is different and, and is host to a unique community of, of species. And, you know, as a scientist, I feel it's, it's, it's my duty and, and, and privilege as well to be able to share with others um, this information and this knowledge and, and get everyone inspired about biodiversity. Get out your back, your front door and go out to your local bush patch and see what's there. And, you know, there's still so much to understand about cicadas. We've, we've got a long road yet and we're still finding uh, new undescribed species. So, you know, the chances are good. There's still opportunity to be able to find a new species of cicada out there and get something named after yourself if you wish. And I'll just um, finish by saying thank you to all the volunteers that we've had um, with our surveys, as well as all the um, 500 odd people who have submitted observations to the project over the past um, five years. And yeah, there's a few websites there that you can um, click on and, and join us in our Cicadarama journey. I'll end it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nathan. That was fantastic. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, so you're happy to take questions? Absolutely. And uh, I'll throw it open to um, anybody putting anything on the chat line. Let me know that you want to ask a question. Everyone's overwhelmed. They are, yeah. I'm fascinated by the 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 um, the creativeness uh, um, of the names and the naming. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, it's it's very unique. It's sort of a case of almost sort of telling it like it is for a lot of these ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kim, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Adrian. All right. Um, Nathan, uh, uh, again, yeah, fascinating talk. Thanks so much. Hey, um, could you just comment on the impact the bushfires in the last summer uh, may have had on 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 um, cicadas? Thanks. Sure. It's um, it's a very, I guess, species specific uh, response. So. I'll, Depending on the species, um, some of them will be quite deep in the soil, um, particularly the larger species, they can be up to a metre below the soil surface. And um, so long as they're, they're near tree roots, they'll be okay because they'll have a food source. So this far down in the, in the soil for a lot of those larger ones, they'll be okay. Um, they, won't, they won't cook in the fire. And we tend to find that actually even the, the fire um, sort of stimulates a bit of, a, of an emergence. And I, I think there were a few reports, particularly up in northern New South Wales, of cicadas emerging um, as little as two, three weeks after the fire um, had ravaged through a lot of these, these areas. And we're, we're talking, you know, very high extreme um, fire severity in, the, in these areas. But it's, a, it's potentially a different story for um, a number of uh, smaller species, which don't um, uh, they're not underground 
as far as these um, larger species. So depending on the fire and how, how quickly it moves through an area and how intense it is, some of these smaller ones may um, be impacted by the fire, but um, we, we really don't know. It's a very sort of species by species basis. And of course, um, dependent on, on the fire itself and also how the trees um, survive or re-sprout um, post-fire or, or, or don't. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Um, the next person on the list is uh, Nathan Tam. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, cheers. Thanks so much, Nathan. Oh, you've got a great name, by the way. <laughs> Back at you. I had to say that. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for that talk. It was great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to... Uh, oh, 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 sorry, I'll just take off the video so it doesn't get in the way. But yeah, uh, I, was just wondering, I was just wondering if there was something specific in the sap in particular trees that might you know, attract different species. Like you were saying, for example, um, like one of the native plants uh, only attracts... Uh, that's the only... Uh, you know, you can only find the eastern double drummer there. So would it be something like, you know, do we know about the composition of what, you know, of what's in those trees that actually attracts different species? Yeah, we, we don't know, well, we know nothing about Australian species. There's a bit of research in America um, on the Magis Carta, which suggests that there's specific carbohydrate um, concentrations in, in the um, sap of some trees that um, cicadas tend to, or that species tends to, to preference, so species that are more rich in carbohydrates. Um, whether that rings true for us, our species, or whether there's something different, it's hard to say. Um, it could be, uh, my money is on something completely different because a lot of our species just don't fit the mould of um, the ecological preferences of, of the Magi cicada and, and, and others um, uh, in different countries. Thanks. Yeah, because I was just thinking, you know, if we could find out, you know, what it is that, you know, that they're wanting, you know, then we could maybe, you know, work out, you know, like you said, predict, you know, what species might actually help some cicadas actually uh, thrive, you know, compared to others and stuff like that. That's yeah, I mean. absolutely. And it's it's kind of prioritizing that too. So if there's if there's something there with the with the um, sap, then we need to look into that in particular. But whether or not the um, the type of, of plant, whether you've got a dense canopy that's going to provide camouflage, is actually more important to a species rather than the um, mm -hmm. than the sap. That's something also then we have to you know think about in terms of uh, conserving our, our plant diversity for for these species. Yes, yeah, so there's still yeah, a lot of work to be done. <laughs> Thanks so much for you know okay. doing so much work for us. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. The next question is from Debbie Andrew, and I'll just read it out. Uh, do different species call at different times of the day? Uh, yes, yes, they do. So there are um, different different species have different calling behaviours. Um, some of the the larger, colourful ones, like the green grocer and the bladder cicada, tend to call on on dusk. Um, they're almost like clockwork, and they get progressively later and later as the days get longer. Um, we think this is a yeah, anti-predator mechanism um, because it's darker and there's there's less um, bird life um, about, or, or they're just they're, they're harder to see in the in the dark as well. Um, a lot of the smaller species will call during the day, um, but there, it is sort of predicated on on temperature, ambient temperature as well. Um, some species it, on really really hot days they will just call all day and all night, which is um, really annoying. We I stayed down at the south coast over Christmas a couple of years ago during the last mass emergence, and we had razor grinders and um, you know Mondays calling all night um, kept us awake, so we didn't get any um, any sleep for a whole week. Um, but on that temperature note too, it, they will get that upper threshold limit too, where they'll just stop singing because the attrition rate is just is just too high for them. So once you get up to 40, 45 degrees, they'll stop calling as well. Thank you. The next one's from Jeff Innes. Uh, is it possible to identify a genus or species by their discarded cases? Uh, yes, it can be quite tricky. Um, some are very easy to 
um, identify the eastern double drummer in particular is is very easy to identify it's usually very low down um, on the trees and their nymph cases are quite dirty quite dusty um, they tend to just keep a lot of a lot of dirt and, and dust on those shells I think in, in Max Moulds's um, uh, Cicadas of Australia book there are um, a few pages um, which have photographs of um, different species nymphal um, cases so as kind of a, a guide but I mean I guess that's you know using some uh, some some plant knowledge or having some plant knowledge too and knowing what um, species a different species uh, uh, not a different sorry let me start that again knowing what plant species a cicada species is more likely to be found on will also help you narrow that um, down okay uh, next question from Liz and Graham uh, Fry and Cameron, uh, or Cameron and Fry, sorry. Why do they have such loud calls? Is it a defence strategy against birds or something else? Uh, yes, yes it is, because birds just like us, they can't handle the noise. So um, cicadas will tend to sing in chorus and you can have um, you know, tens, twenties, 30 males on, on the trunk of a eucalyptus all calling at the same time and they're in plain sight you can see them but they're not getting picked off by the the birds or, or the wildlife just because they're all calling um, and of course the in the larger species they all sing in unison too because the females will come to the singing males so it's also um, of benefit if you're perhaps you know not as fit a male not as loud that you just hang out with the noisy um, mates and you know by chance if you if, if you're lucky you might um, land yourself the the girl as she comes to to um, to the males so yeah primarily a, a um, anti-predatory um, defense okay thank you um, next one's from Alana Allison are the notorious noisy miners having a quantitatively negative impact on cicada populations Noisy miners, um, not, well, yes and no. They, I don't believe they are impacting as negatively as some of the other um, species or birds out there. Um, I'm thinking the um, Karawongs in particular um, and, and ravens. Um, but to a lesser degree, the noisy miners too. The, the currawongs are really, really smart birds and can pick off um, cicada species or individuals just through um, waiting. I, I've, I've seen um, one sit on power lines um, nearby where a male bladder cicada is calling and, and the bladder cicada has a, a very low guttural growl, um, which is hard to sort of triangulate in a, in a leafy shrub. And it'll just sit there until a female comes in because she's attracted to the male and the currawong will then swoop in and then take the male and the female both at, at one time so you know these birds are becoming really really smart um in the urban areas and and as we at, with changing climate too they're staying in areas for longer as well so that's potentially having a, a another um impact on the cicada populations but so yes while noisy miners do um predate or prey on um, cicada species it's not just them there's there's other birds as well it's, uh, it's all very interesting um, another one from nathan tam um, how do we know how long a cicada stays underground how did we find out it can be up to 17 years I, you may have touched on this yeah, so the 17 years is actually, um, well, at this stage, specific to the Magi Cicada in, in the United States. So it has that uh, prime number years of between, I, I think it's either, um, what is it, 13 or 17 years. Um, they've done a lot of research on the Magi Cicada and they can pretty much predict it down to the day where the different broods will um, emerge across the states. Um, here we're sort of using a lot of anecdotal um, evidence, um, particularly on the green grocer. We, we're sort of using the boom and bust um, cycles for these larger species. So we know we have um, around about seven or 10 years 
or excuse me, for um, larger species like the greengrocer because they've been absent in some regions. Um, Bundanoon in the Southern Highlands comes to mind where um, a 2000 and, uh, was it 2010, there was a very large emergence there. And then for the years following that, absolutely nothing. And then they emerged again um, and in, in mass in 2017, 2018. So we, we think from that there's around about that, that seven to, to 10 year cycle, but we just need to be able to collect more data. Um, the more observations that we have, the, the, the faster we'll be able to sort of understand that time. But we, we assume for some of the smaller species, they don't need that amount of time to mature fully underground because they don't need to get to such a large size. Okay, look, um, there's no more questions on the chat line. I'll just throw it open to uh, uh, one more question for, uh, if anybody couldn't get through on the chat line. Anybody there want to ask a final question? No? Okay. Uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, call a halt there. It's um, Fascinating topic, Nathan. It's been wonderful listening to you, and I uh, appreciate the time that you've um, you've spent uh, coming here to be with us tonight and your wealth of knowledge. Uh, but I'd like to now hand over formally to uh, Adrian Polhill to give a formal vote of thanks on behalf of Oatley Flora and Fauna Conservation Society to you. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, thank you, uh, Nathan. Take a bow. You're magic what you've said to us what you've taught us tonight uh, unbelievable you know we've we've all enjoyed it really really much you know it's it's uh, what you you know your passion certainly shown through um all the work you've done and particularly the citizen science project to to mount that and have so many fabulous responses wow it's um we take our hats off to you um and uh, you know continue your fabulous work thanks for your time today and we've really enjoyed it thanks nathan so much